chapter thirteen of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva good fishing a clock struck the hour of nine mrs cheyne lowered the volume of shaw's plays the pages of which she had made a pretense of reading and frowned at the corner of the rug she now wore a house gown of clinging material whose colors changed from bronze to purple in the shadow of the lamps it fitted her slim figure closely like chain mail and shimmered softly like the skin of a dusky chameleon mrs cheyne was fond of uncertain colors in a low key and her hour was in the dim of twilight which lent illusions stimulated the imagination to a perception of the meaning of shadows softened shadows which hung around her eyes and mouth which by day were merely lines a little bitter a little hard a little cynical mrs cheyne's effects were all planned with exquisite care the amber-colored shades the warmish rug and scarlet table cover the chinese mandarin's robe on her piano the azaleas in the yellow pots all were a part of a color scheme upon which she had spent much thought her great wealth had not spoiled her taste for simplicity the objects upon her table and mantel-shelf were few but choice and their arrangement each with reference to the other showed an artistry which had learned something from japan she hated ugliness beauty was her fetish the one great sorrow of her life was the knowledge that her own face was merely pretty but the slight irregularity of her features somewhat condoned for this misfortune and she had at last succeeded in convincing herself that the essence of beauty lies rather in what it suggests than in what it reveals nature by way of atoning for not making each feature perfect had endowed them all with a kind of protean mobility and her mind with a genius for suggestion which she had brought to a high degree of usefulness without therefore being beautiful at all she gave the impression of beauty and she rejoiced in the reputation which she possessed of being marked dangerous she had rejoiced in it moreover because she had been aware that no matter how dangerous she might prove to be with others with herself she had not been dangerous the kind of romance the kind of sentiment in which she indulged she had come to regard as highly specialized art in which she was past grand mistress she loved them for their own sake she was a fisher of men but fished only for the love of fishing and it was her pleasure while her victims still writhed to unhook them as tenderly as might be and let them flap ungracefully back into their own element her fly-book was a curiosity and of infinite variety Isaac walton advances the suggestion that trout bite not for hunger but wantonness rita cheyne was of the opinion that men bit for a similar reason and so she whipped the social streams ruthlessly for the mere joy of the game matching her skill to the indifference of her quarry her artistry to their vehemence and now she suddenly discovered that she must throw her fly-book away she had tried them all the silver doctor the white mouth the brown hackle and all to no purpose her fish had risen but he would not bite she was fishing in unfamiliar waters 
deeper waters where there were hidden currents she could not understand the tackle she had used when fishing for others would not serve for jeff ray it provoked her that her subtlety was of no avail for she had the true fisher's contempt for heavy tackle and yet she realized that it was only heavy tackle which would land him he was the only man who had really interested her in years and his conquest was a matter of pride with her she had other reasons too his wife was beautiful rita cheyne was merely artistic victory meant that beauty was only an incident that art after all was immortal the theory of a whole lifetime needed vindication when ray entered she was deep in you never can tell but looked up at her visitor slowly and extended a languid hand aren't you early she asked slipping a marker in the pages of her book and closing it slowly no i don't think so i thought i was late i was detained she held up a hand in protest i was really hoping you might not come i've been really so amused and when one is really amused nowadays one should expect nothing more of the gods ray got up hurriedly i won't butt in then i don't want to disturb oh sit down do you make me nervous have a cigarette i'll take one too now tell me what on earth is the matter with you the matter nothing i'm all right you've changed somehow when i met you at the bents i thought you the most wonderful person i had ever met with great very great possibilities even at the janey's the illusion still remained something has happened to change you you do nothing but scowl and say the wrong thing there's no excuse for any man to do that i'm worried there's been a slight tangle in my plans i but i'm not going to trouble you with i want to hear of course you went to washington yes to see some of our congressmen i have the law on my side in this fight and i'm trying to make things copper lined so there can't be a leak anywhere those fellows down there are afraid of their own lives they act as though they were on the lookout for somebody to stab them in the back washington is too near new york a fellow goes there from the west and in about six months he's a changed man he forgets that he ever came from god's country and learns how to bow and scrape and lick boots i reckon that's the way to get what you want here in the east but it goes against my grain weren't you successful oh yes i found out what i wanted to know it's only a question of money they'll fall in line when i'm ready but it's going to take cash more than i thought it would are you going to have enough my credit's good and i'm paying eight per cent eight why i only get four i know eight is the legal rate in my state business is done on that basis i wish i could help you know i'm horribly rich i'd like to look into the matter will you let me yes but there's a risk you see i'm honest with you i'll give stock as security and a share in the profits but my stock isn't exactly like government bonds who is your lawyer i'll put it up to him if you like stephen gillis but he'll do what i say i'd rather you consulted him oh yes i shall but i have faith in you jeff ray it seems like a good speculation i'd like you to send me all the data i'll really look into it seriously she stopped and examined his face in some concern in the lamplight she saw the lines that worry had drawn there but not to-night you've had enough of business you're tired in your mind she paused again that he might the better understand her meaning but you're more tired in your heart business is the least of your worries am i right yes he said sullenly i'm very sorry 
is there any way in which i can help no the decision in his tone was not encouraging but she persevered you don't want help it isn't a matter i can speak about oh her big fish was sulking in the deeps it was a case for shark bait and a dipsy lead you won't tell me very well frankness is a privilege of friendship i'll use it your wife is in love with my cousin cortland ray started violently how do you know she smiled oh i don't know i guessed it's true though she paused and examined him curiously he had subsided in his chair his head on his breast his brows lowering are you unhappy she asked no he muttered at last it's time we understood each other what are you going to do about it do nothing he said with a short laugh there's nothing to do i'm a good deal of a fool but i know that putting trouble in a woman's way never made her quit going after what she'd set her mind on if i licked court bent she'd make me out a brute if i shot him she'd make him out a martyr any way i'm a loser i'm going my own way and she he got up and strode the length of the room and back and then spoke constrainedly i'm not going to speak of this matter to you or to anyone else he dropped into his chair beside her again and glared at the window curtain mrs cheyne leaned one elbow on the arm of her chair which was nearest him and sighed deeply why is it that we always marry the wrong people if life wasn't so much of a joke i'd be tempted to cry over the fallibility of human nature the love of one's teens is the only love that is undiluted with other motives the only love that's really what love was meant to be it's perfectly heavenly but of course it's entirely unpractical marrying one's first love is iconoclasm it's a sacrilege a profanation and ought to be prohibited by law first love was meant for memory only to sweeten other memories later on but it was never meant for domestication rose petals amid cabbage leaves incense amid the smells of an apartment kitchen she sank back in her chair again and mused dreamily her eyes on the open fire it's a pretty madness she sighed romance thrives on unrealities what has it in common with the butcher you know she paused and gave a quick little laugh you know chain and i fell in love at first sight he was an adorable boy and he made love like an angel he had a lot of money too almost as much as i had but he didn't let that spoil him not then he used to work quite hard before we were married and was really a useful citizen matrimony ruined him it does some men he got to be so comfortable and contented in his new condition that he forgot that there was anything else in the world but comfort and content even me he began to get fat and bald don't you hate bald-headed men with beards he was so sleek shiny and respectable that he got on my nerves he didn't want to go anywhere but to symphony concerts and the opera sometimes he played quite dolefully on the cello he even insisted on doing so when we had people into dinner it was really very inconsiderate of him when everyone wanted to be jolly he began making a collection of cellos too which stood around the walls of the music-room in black cases like coffins imagine a taste like that the thing i had once mistaken for poetry for sentiment had degenerated into a kind of flabby sentimentality which extended to all of the common places of existence i found that it wasn't really me that he loved at all it was love that he loved i had made a similar mistake we discovered it quite casually one evening after dinner she broke off with a sigh 
what's the use i suppose you'll think i'm selfish talking of myself mine is an old story time has mellowed it agreeably yours is newer i'm very sorry for you but you know that i'm sorry i've told you so before i think i understand you better now and i you and then softly mrs ray was your first love no he muttered she was my last mrs cheyne's lids dropped and she looked away from him had ray been watching her he would have discovered that the ends of her lips were flickering on the verge of a smile but ray's gaze was on the andirons they sat there in silence for some moments but ray who first spoke restored her self-complacency you're very kind to me he said slowly you say you like me because i'm different from other fellows here i suppose i am i was born different I, and i guess i grew up different if you think i'm worth while then i'm glad i grew up the way i did he got up and walked slowly the length of the room she watched him doubtfully wondering what was passing in his mind she learned in a moment for when he approached her again he leaned over her chair and without the slightest warning had put his arms around her and kissed her again and again on the lips she did not struggle or resist it seemed impossible to do so and she was too bewildered for a moment to do anything but sit and stare blankly before her he was a strange fish a most extraordinary fish which rose only when one had stopped fishing it was the way he did it that appalled her he was so brutal so cold-blooded when he released her she rose abruptly her face pale and her lips trembling illustration she did not struggle or resist it seemed impossible to do so how could you she said how could you and then with more composure she turned and pointed toward the door i wish you'd please go at once but as he stood staring at her she was obliged to repeat don't you hear me i want you to go and not to come back isn't that plain or would you prefer to have me ring for a servant no i don't prefer either he said with a smile i don't want to go i want to stay here with you that's what i came for she walked over to the door and stood by the bell do you wish me to ring of course not will you go no she raised her hand toward the bell but halted it in mid-air ray noticed her hesitation wait a moment don't be foolish rita i have something to say to you it wouldn't reflect much credit on either of us for you to send me out i thought we understood each other i'm sorry you said once that you liked me because i was plain-spoken and because i said and did just what came into my head but you haven't been fair with me what do you mean just this you and i were to speak to each other freely of ourselves and of each other you said you needed me and i knew i needed you we decided it was good to be friends that was our agreement you broke it willfully you have acted with me precisely as you have acted with a dozen other men it was lucky i discovered my danger in time i don't think any woman in the world could do as much with me as you could if you wanted to when i like anybody i try to show them that i do if you were a man i'd give you my hand or loan you money or help you in business i can't do that with you you're a woman and meant to be kissed so i kissed you she dropped her hands yes you kissed me brutally shamelessly shamelessly you've insulted me i'll never forgive you don't you think a woman can tell there are other ways of judging a man i've interested you yes because you've never known any real woman before contemptuously i suppose you're interested still you ought to be but you can never care for any woman until you forget to be interested in yourself for you the sun rises and sets in jeff ray 
and you want other people to think so too i'm sorry you think so badly of me oh no i don't think badly of you from the present moment i shan't think of you at all i i dislike you intensely i want to be alone will you please go ray gave her his blandest stare and then shrugged his shoulders and turned toward the door you're willing to have me go like this yes i'm going west tomorrow. it makes no difference to me where you are going won't you forgive me no as he passed her he offered his hand in one last appeal but she turned away from him her hands behind her and in a moment he was gone rita cheyne heard the hall door close behind him and then sank into the chair before the open fire her eyes staring before her at the tiny flame which still played fitfully above the gray log her fish had risen at last with such wanton viciousness that he had taken hook line reel and rod only her creel remained to her her empty creel End of chapter 13